Oh hi, I'm the heretic. So you all know the story of Moses, yes? A guy who leads the Israelites out of Egypt by splitting apart the Red Sea for them to just walk through. It's pretty dramatic, and it's pretty straightforward if you strip away the symbolism of what's happening. But what's even more interesting is to see how people got to that point. In this case, what got Moses to go from being a shepherd to go, hey, let's liberate the Jews? So this will be Moses' defining moment when the Lord manifests before him and tasks him with the liberation of his people from bondage in ancient Egypt. And no, not the kinky kind of bondage either, unfortunately. Anyways, what happens is that God tells Moses to speak to the Pharaoh of Egypt and to free the Israelites and deliver them to a land of milk and honey. Let's check it out. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And then the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou lay unto the children of Israel the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Wow, God is not a dick. So what's going on here? Playing out is something called the Hero's Journey monomyth. The Hero's Journey is a storytelling archetype about a hero who goes on an adventure, achieves victory in a decisive crisis, and comes home transformed. It's the archetype for many classic tales from Homer's Odyssey all the way up to The Hunger Games, The Lion King, and Star Wars, the original trilogy. We can see the same structure in place with Moses' story. The Hero's Journey begins with an ordinary world what the hero's life was like before their adventure. In this case, Moses is a shepherd who goes onto a mountain. But there's more going on here. Mountains are as much symbols as they are geological features in the Bible. Here's a question for you to consider. Where does God live? Heaven. Where is heaven? Up there. Thus, in order to be closer to God, you have to be up, higher. The mountain symbolizes spiritual closeness to God, something one doesn't just come to accidentally. So Moses was clearly a pious man, 
certainly a meek and humble one, if his chosen profession is any indication. So he goes up onto the mountain and receives his call to adventure. Whoosh! A bush bursts into flames as an angel of the Lord appears before him. Moses is intrigued and goes out of his way to investigate. A bush suddenly catches on fire without a kindle, and the bush itself is unharmed. How can this be? The Lord tells Moses to go to Pharaoh. Now, here's the next stage of the hero's journey, the refusal to the call to action. Moses thinks of himself as just a guy. Who is he? Just a poor shepherd to presume to talk to someone as great and mighty as Pharaoh. He doesn't have the eloquence nor the credibility to even be taken seriously by the Israelites, let alone the Pharaoh. Now, refusing the call to adventure is a classic part of the hero's journey, showcasing their reluctance and insecurity in facing the challenges ahead. Further showcased when the Lord calls out to Moses and he hides his face. After all, the eyes are the window into the soul. Moses turning away has nothing to do with him not wanting to look upon God, but on him not wanting to be looked upon by God. Showing his concern about the Lord would see if he looked into his eyes. We can take what God is saying about freeing the Israelites at face value here. They're enslaved to the Egyptians, and they can't take it anymore, so have prayed to God for deliverance. Moses is being called to free them from slavery. Yay! Though we should also address the bush itself. Why did God choose to manifest himself to Moses in this way? What does a bush that's on fire but doesn't collapse into cinders mean? Well, first off, what could the fire itself represent? Well, God frequently manifests in flame. He appeared to Abraham as a burning lamp in Genesis 15:17 and the Lord would descend upon Mount Sinai to Moses in Exodus 19.18. The symbol of flame itself reveals the Lord to be a source of light, warmth, and nourishment to his people. After all, fire keeps the darkness away, it cooks food, and it purifies water. But fire can also be harsh and destructive. It's also a perfect visual metaphor for the Israelites' conditions. The bush was burning but not consumed, damaged, but not destroyed. The bush symbolizes the faith of the Israelites and their endurance in spite of these harsh conditions. God has heard their prayers and now brings deliverance. But perhaps most telling is what happens when Moses asks what to call God. Who does he tell the Israelites who sent him? God replies, I am what I am. He says, and I am sends Moses to free the Israelites. Now, what does I am mean? Better question, what is God? There is only one God in the universe, a singular being unique in all of existence. I am is the expression of God's nature as the ultimate individual. I am is an affirmation of God as the supreme individual. Moses he acknowledged the Lord by affirming his own individuality. When addressed, he said, Here am I. God tells Moses he will be with him. All will be well, affirming to them that though he is one guy, a common shepherd, albeit one with a, a very privileged background, this is what this whole passage is about, the affirmation of the power of the individual. With help, one man can change the fate of an entire people. And after all, why not? Jesus Christ, one man, changes the freaking world. Moses was called by God not because he was special, not because he had superpowers or some connections. He was the one with the curiosity to approach the flame, and the wisdom to, when called, say, Here I am, Lord. The way I see it, each of us is unique. We all share that aspect of our Lord, our God, the supreme individual. We were all created in God's image, and thus we are all individuals. And the individual is supreme. There is no you that has ever existed, and nobody like you ever will exist again. We all have at least a little bit of God's power in us, and the power to change the world. That's what this passage is all about. 
affirming the power that we all have inside of us. All God asks us to do is to be humble, be ready, and when the call to adventure is made, say, here am I. Now all this is well and good, but what does this mean for you? Think about all the things you've told yourself you can't do. Maybe there's artists you admire for their skills or musicians, but you don't think you could achieve that level of ability. Maybe your life seems to be a game of chance rather than anything you can control. All too often, we fall into the trap of passivity and just assuming we're owed good news or happiness. This is wrong. Just, just ask yourself, why not? Why not learn that cool new skill? Why not take more initiative and do what you have to to get the results you want? Why not take responsibility for everything that could happen to you? Now, I admit, I'm not the best example of this in practice, but am I wrong? If I am, then so be it. If things must happen outside of our control, then be content with the knowledge that you did absolutely everything you could to change it. After all, Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt. You don't think that was easy, or if there weren't other things he'd rather be doing? So, what are you waiting for? Questions? Comments? Critique? What are the limits of what you're capable of? What are mine? Support me through Patreon or through a one-time donation on Ko-Fi. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.